And let's ask God's blessing. Father, we love you. And we thank you that you love us. And Lord, we ask that you would speak to our hearts tonight through your word. Help us, Lord, to be yielded to you. Open to your spirit. Guide us and direct us. Thank you, Lord, that you haven't left us without instruction and without comfort. For your word and your spirit is efficient and sufficient. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah, the priest, has made a career change. Well, it really wasn't a career change. It was a calling that changed his career from actually from priest to prophet. God has called the prophet Ezekiel to come to his own people and to speak to them. And the way that God chooses to speak to them is a lot different than what we would think or imagine that they should be spoken to. For in the life of Ezekiel's ministry, God is going to use him sometimes totally silent. Totally and absolutely silent. He won't speak a word. But he'll do things in front of him. Draw a picture. Act a certain way. Matter of fact, as I was studying today, I realized that God told him, as we'll find out here in chapter 3, that God told him not to say anything for seven years. Only to break the silence every once in a while. Just a few times. But he stays quiet for seven years. He's to shut himself up in his house and go, not to go outside. And so he, 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 but he is telling the people as he is doing all this, these are messages. As we talked about in Jeremiah, action sermons, sermon illustrations to, to, to communicate what God is doing and is doing in the life of these people. They had stopped listening to God. They had stopped listening to the prophets of God. And so God began to draw them a picture. And which they couldn't ignore. They couldn't stop seeing. And so God was drawing them a picture through the life and the examples of Ezekiel, this prophet. Now, in chapters 1 and 2, we saw... God reveal himself and to reveal glory to the prophet Ezekiel. You remember the throne room of God, the, the cherubs that he saw, the angels, these, these um, uh, four-winged angels, these wheels within a wheels that were beside the angels, and whichever way they went, the wheels went, and they, they would go up and down. They had four faces upon them. They, they had, and they were called the living creatures. We see them also in the book of Revelation, and we still are studying about them as we go through the book of Revelation on, on, on Sunday mornings. And so he has been called to, 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 to preach after he has received this vision from God. Now, we'll get into this, and I'll bring that point back up in just a second, but let's take a look at chapter 3 here. He says, Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat what thou findest. You remember 
the last couple of verses, God had handed him a scroll. And the scroll was not uh, really a nice scroll. It had a lot of woes and desolation attached to it. A lot of mourning and woes and lamentations written all the way through it in the front and the back. But God takes that scroll and gives it to him and he is now told, he says, now, he says, now eat what you find. Take this scroll, old King James, take the roll and eat it. Now, it's not something that he was supposed to put mustard on and eat this roll or, or this scroll. He, he's not doing that. Uh, but we have a phrase, devouring a book. And uh, I think maybe this is what God is intending Isaiah to do, is desiring Isaiah to do, is to devour it. Get it inside of you. And he says, he says, now eat that which you find and eat this scroll and go speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat that scroll. And he said in verse 3 <clears throat> unto me, son of man, eat and fill thy stomach with this scroll that I give thee. And he says, then I did eat, and it was in my mouth like honey for sweetness. You know, when, you're, when you are devouring the word of God, when you're in, in consuming the word of God, it should have this sweetness to your mouth. John had the same kind of experience. He says, he says I, I, I uh, ate the word of God, ate this scroll, and he says, I, I devoured this thing, and he says, it was sweet to my taste, but it turned bitter later on. Jeremiah will say later on that this scroll, once it gets down into him, it turned bitter. I mean, Ezekiel did, does. Jeremiah says, I did find thy word, and it was, it was like honey. It was pleasant to eat. And so Jer Ezekiel, and if I say Jeremiah, I mean Ezekiel. Ezekiel, <clears throat> Ezekiel was devouring the scroll, and it was just sweet to his taste. What does the scripture say? Taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And it was like honey. Psalms 19 says, Moreover, to be desired than fine gold, sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. The word of God, the law of the Lord is perfect. The statues of the Lord. All that, and he says, it's more to be desired than fine gold, and, and it's sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. And so he says, he said unto me, son of man, go now. Get thee unto the house of Israel and speak with my words unto them. Anyone that is called into the ministry first must have a, I think, a vision of God. He must, he, must be, he must see God in, in some way. Now, now, I'm not saying that, that we see God in, in, a, in a way of like Isaiah did. High and lifted up. His train fills the temple. You know, the smoke and all this and, 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 and this, the altar and actually see God in, in heaven. Or maybe Isaiah did. But there must be a vision in the man's heart. But there's also a Along with that, a, a, this accompaniment of a, a, of a call upon his life. And a, and a devouring of the word of God. If a man doesn't devour the word of God, he doesn't have, to have, anything, he doesn't have anything to say. I mean, if he's not devouring the word of God, please, don't say anything. And a lot of people, a lot of times, think that, hey, you know the... The ministry, that's a good occupation to be in. And there are people that are in the pulpits today that ought not to be there because they've chosen it to be a career rather than a calling. And they need to know that the, this is not a career, this is a calling. 
I stand here because I know that God has called me to teach the word of God. People think that they can get up there, and they could. There are probably some that are very excellent expositors of the word of God that could share 300, 400 times better than I could. And they might be able to tell you all about the Greek and the, and the Hebrew and all this and the Aramaic and what the Italians say about it, you know. And, and I don't know, but, but they can get into that. But if they're not called of God and the word of God is not in them, that they haven't devoured it, they haven't consumed themselves with it. And then God hasn't commissioned them to go. Here's another thing. If God hasn't told them to go, they need not to apply. And so God says, now I want you to go and get unto the house of Israel. He tells them to go to the house of Israel. He had a place to fulfill the ministry. He wasn't called to go anywhere else. He was called to a certain people. <clears throat> and he says, and speak with my words. It's not that I'm supposed to speak anything else but God's word. I'm not supposed to tell you my thoughts, my ideas, my desires. I'm to teach you God's word as a pastor, as a teacher. I'm not to fill your mind with anything else but God's word. And this is what God is telling Ezekiel. He's saying, Ezekiel, I want you to tell them my words. Not yours. Just tell them my words. Unto them. He says, for thou art not sent to a people of strange speech and a hard language. But I'm sending, to you, sending, them, sending you to your own people. Somebody that speaks your own language. And he says, not too many people of a strange speech or, and of a hard language whose words thou cannot understand. Basically, he says, I'm not sending you to somebody that you need an interpreter for or to, to, to convey. But somebody, he says, I'm sending you to the people that understand you. And he said, but if I had sent you to them they would hearken unto you. <laughs> now this is almost a kind of a slap in the face of the nation of Israel in captivity. I mean, just think about it. Here they are in captivity, and God says to Ezekiel, I'm going to call you now to your people here sitting in, in captivity, and now I want you to know something. I'm not, I'm not going to send you to the Babylonians. I'm not going to send you to the Persians. I'm not going to send you to the people that are around you with all the various language groups. I'm sending you to your own people. But if I was to send you to the people that don't know you, don't know how to speak your language, and don't know how to uh, 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 do that, they would accept you, and they would believe you, and they would receive you. But the people that have been listening to you and listening to Jeremiah back in Jerusalem, he says, they're not going to listen to you. Now that's, I don't know, how you would receive that if God called you into a ministry and says, guess what? You're not going to be successful, but I'm calling you anyway. Would you go? Would you do it? I, I remember when I was um, in the prison ministry, we had to go by the rules of the prison. You know, and when the captain allowed us to go, we went. And, and and when he opened up the cell doors, the guys could come to church and, and all that. And, and we'd come with our group. We'd come with a band. We'd be, we were uh, PRing it for weeks in advance, and, and uh, everything was done. And we'd get there, and we'd, we'd get into a room about this size, and uh, there'd be nobody there. And we'd think, well, they, they must be holding count or something like that, you know, when they have to count every prisoner and make sure that they're there and all that, because bad things happen when they're not and stuff like that. So they, 
they were counting them all, and, and then you release them. I said, well, maybe just holding up on count. And then I'd call the captain and say, hey, are you releasing these guys? And they said, well, we're going to release the, the clerks. And I remember this one, we were at a women's prison. Diane was with us, and this one, uh, two clerks came down. We had this big old room. We had two women sitting in the seats, this full-on band. We had more people on the stage than we did in the an audience. And I remember uh, the devil just speaking to me and says, you, you just why don't you pack up and go? Matter of fact, one of the girls says, you know, why don't you guys just pack up and go? I says, hey, we came to have a church service, and that's what we're going to do. And really? Yeah. So we had a concert. And then I taught the word of God, and then we packed up and left, and they went back to their cells. Well, they got so blessed that we would spend time with just that, those two women, that the next time we came, the place was packed out. And you know why? Their whole reason was because they said, we heard that you stayed just for those two women, the two clerks. We thought, man, that's got to be great, you know. And so we just saw that, that sometimes when you do things, it might not be successful, but you need to be faithful to it. And, and there's things that, that look like they're drying up, but don't move. When Elijah was by the, the, the brook, you remember, and it was drying up, he didn't move. Why? Because God didn't tell him to leave. God had commanded them to stay there and receive the food and the meat that the birds brought into him twice a day. And every day he would, he would look at that stuff that the crows would bring in and drop down. And you know what crows pick up? Chariot kill, you know? Road kill, you know? And just, and just they would bring it and, 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 and he, they would bring it, drop it down there. It was unclean. And he'd sit there and he'd say, okay, uh, um, fine. And he'd eat. And, and, and he, every day he watched that brook get lower and lower and lower and dry up, dry up, dry up. And all of a sudden, one day God called him to another work, another place. And lo and behold, you remember he got there and the person was dying because they were running out of food already. But God took care of him. See, God doesn't care what, what's going on in a sense of materially or whatever is too much. He's just asking us to be faithful to him. And he's asking Ezekiel the same thing. Go. You're not, they're not going to listen to you, but go anyway. Now he's going to really lay it on in just a second here. But he says, I'm going to send you to them. They are not going to listen to you. But the house of Israel will not hearken unto you, in verse 7. For they will not hearken unto me. I mean, they, uh, they're not listening to me, and so they're not going to listen to you, Ezekiel. For all the house of Israel... They're stone-faced. They're stubborn. And they're hard-hearted. He says that, that and, 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 but he, notice what he's still doing. He says they're not going to listen. Why? Because you remember in Jeremiah, Jeremiah was telling them they're going to go away into captivity. He told them that. And then when... They're there. Ezekiel's there. And they're not listening. They're not listening to God. Why? Because there's false prophets in their midst saying, listen, it's only going to be a few more days until we go back to Jerusalem. You know, uh, King Zedekiah, he's, he's making league with, with, uh, with uh, Egypt, and, uh, and they're going to come together, and they're going to form an alliance, and they'll conquer Babylon, and we'll be back home. So we're not going to stay here very many days. And so they're not listening to Ezekiel. They're not listening to Daniel. They're, they, and, and, and they weren't listening to Jeremiah when he was in Jerusalem, when they were in Jerusalem with him. And so they're, they're, they're not listening. But then you remember in Jeremiah chapter 29, Jeremiah wrote them a letter and sent it to Babylon and said, No, don't listen to the false prophets. You're staying. You're going to be there for 70 years. Matter of fact, Build your homes, start your businesses, have children, give your children to other, other people and have grandchildren because you're going to be there for a long time. And, and so they're not listening. 
And God says they weren't listening to me in Jerusalem. They're not listening to me in Babylon. They're still listening to the false prophets. And Ezekiel, they're not going to listen to you. And he tells us that they're just stubborn, hard-hearted people. Behold, he says, I have, but he says, I have made your face strong against their faces and thy forehead strong against their, for, their foreheads. <laughs> you can imagine, he tells Jeremiah, he says, they're stiff-necked, hard-hearted, stubborn people, but I'm going to make you even stubborner, more stubborn. I'm going to make, them, make you hard-hearted. I'm going to make your forehead hard, he says. And, and, and he says, and, and he's, he's, he's going to be tougher than they are. He goes on, and he says, like an advenin, or a diamond, basically, harder than flint, harder than a rock. He says, have I made thy forehead? Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they are a rebellious house. He says, you're going to go out there, and you're going to talk to them. You're going to say the word of God. You're going to share with them. And they're going to stand there, and they're going to scarl at you. They're going to just make faces at you like, you know, you, you stupid prophet. I don't want to hear from you. You're always doing, saying this, saying that, you know. And, and they're going to be mad at you. And God says, I'm going to make your forehead harder than a diamond, harder than a rock. And you're just going to go after them. And he said, but you just keep on. Don't get fearful or dismayed at their looks. Just keep going. Now, he says here, moreover, well, I think, I think the reason why God said this and, and just kind of uh, told Ezekiel this is because even though God said they're not going to listen to you, I think Ezekiel probably saying, no, they might listen to me. You ever thought that you could do a better job than God could? I mean, we all have done that in one time or another in our life. Uh, God said something, we think, no, <laughs> you know, it's not that way. And... Paul, you remember, God says to Paul, you're going to be arrested in Jerusalem. And he's not. Uh, he was going to go anyway. And uh, he says, chains and bonds await me in Jerusalem. It's been prophesied everywhere I go. But here he goes to Jerusalem. He gets there and the church says, hey, you know, we, we got some guys that need to pay some vows. And would you sponsor them? And would you go? And he said, sure. And so he goes to the temple with these guys and some people see him that were European Jews in a sense, and they see uh, Paul there, and they think he's brought in a Gentile, and they start a whole stink, you remember? And, hey, he's, brought, he's defiled the temple, you know, he's brought in some Gentiles to the temple, and a riot breaks out. The soldiers in the Antonio Fortress come in after him and rescue him. And as they are pulling him up there, up to the steps of the Antonio Fortress, Paul says, hey, to the, the guard, he says, can I speak to them? And he said, well, yeah, sure. And so Paul uh, says, brothers, um, I know how you feel. I, I was in the same spot that you were. I, 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 I persecuted this, this, this religion and, and, and all that. But one day Jesus Christ appeared to me and, 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 and spoke to me and and. and, and on the road to Damascus, and he starts to tell his whole testimony. And they were listening. But then he says, and, but you guys turn your back, and, and, and God called me to the Gentiles. Well, when he said Gentiles, the whole place erupted in a riot. <laughs> I mean, they just went crazy. And, 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 and they went after him, and, and, and the centurion said, take him down there to the dungeon and find out what... Uh, uh, you know, beat him, scourge him, and find out what he was saying to him. Because he was speaking to him in Hebrew, and, and they only spoke Greek. And uh, that's when Paul says, hey, you know, I, uh, is it right for, for you to beat a, you know, a, a citizen of Rome before being tried? And they said, are you a citizen of Rome? He said, yeah. Centurion came back in and said, hey, you know, are, 
are you really a citizen? He said, yeah. He said, well, I bought my citizenship. And Paul says, well, I was free born. And so they didn't do anything to him and, and all that. They just held him. But for the next two years, Paul was a prisoner held there. But I thought that, and, and really you remember, Jesus had to come to Paul and comfort him because I think in the heart of Paul, he thought, if I could just have a chance with these people, they'll listen to me. And they didn't. And here he sat in the jail and Jesus came to him that night and says, you've done good, Paul. And you're going to go to Rome now and give testimony of me there. It was another two years before he gets there, but, but he was gone. And so here, here he comes, and, and, and God just says, you're, going to be, you're, you're not going to be listened to. You're going to be talking to some stubborn people. And he says, moreover, in verse 10, he said unto me, son of man, all my words. Now, he says, my words, tell him my words. But now he says, all my words that I shall speak unto you. Receive in your heart and hear with your ears. He says, all my word, all my word, all my word, receive in your heart and hear with your ears. Why? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And we're to receive the word of God in all of it, Genesis to Revelation. Every bit of it from Genesis to Revelation is God's word. I like what Warren Worsby was talking about at the conference that we were at. He said, I believe that from Genesis to Revelation is all the word of God. He says, this is inspired. It's God breathed. He said, I even believe the covers are inspired of God. And we all kind of looked at him. He says, the covers. That means you don't add anything to it or you don't take anything out of it. It's the word of God. We don't add anything to it. And, 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 so, and I believe that. I, I totally believe that. That's the word of God. And, and, and so he says, he says now I want you to receive it in your heart. Get it in your heart. The scripture says if you get the word of God in your heart, it keeps you from what? Sinning. How can a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed to the word of God. I have hid thy word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The word of God down in our hearts. And then next he says, and go, get thee to them of the captivity unto the children of, of the people and speak unto them and tell them, thus saith the Lord God. Whether they hear or whether they forbear, it's not up to you to be successful. It's just up to you to be faithful. God wants us to just go and share the word of God, no matter if they hear or they don't hear. You just go and share. No matter if they hear or they don't hear, it doesn't matter. It's up to you. God just is asking you to go and share the word of God. Go, get to them. And then notice what he says. And really, we have this idea that we're supposed to be, we've got to share the word of God and bring them all in. And we haven't really completed the whole thing if we don't have them receive Christ. You know, that's our mentality, I guess. Our, we get paid by commission. We don't get paid by commission. But we get paid by salary. State and straight salary, just it doesn't matter. You, you just do your job in, in the sense of sharing the word of God. And it's not by might nor by power. It's by his spirit that people come to Christ. It's by, by just sharing the word of God, you water, you planting, watering, and the spirit of God. God gives the increase, the Bible says. And so he, he goes on and he says here in verse 12, he says, then the Spirit lifted me up. Now, you're going to see this several times in the ministry of Ezekiel, that God just picks him up and takes him somewhere. Literally. Picks him up and trans, uh, uh, transports him to a location. Now, that would be pretty neat. Philip 
experienced the same thing. You remember in Acts chapter 8? Just that the Spirit of God picked him up, took him somewhere, gets, joins himself to an Ethiopian eunuch, shares his scriptures with him, and when he gets done, the Spirit he, he comes out of the water after he baptizes him, and the Spirit takes him, and he's gone. Many raptures. Just boom, boom. Just out of this place and into another. And, and the Spirit of the Lord's doing this several times. And, and you'll see this. The Spirit lifted me up, and I heard behind me a voice of great rushings, saying, Blessed be the glory of the Lord for, for his place. And I heard also the noise of the wings of the living creatures that touched one another, and the noise of the wheels beside them, and the noise of the great rushing. I mean, he's hearing uh, these angelic beings and the presence of God, what's going on, the sound that's going on around the, the throne room of God. And so the Spirit lifted me up, transported me, and took me away. And I went in bitterness. And in the heat of my spirit. But the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. He says, God's word came into me. I devoured it. It was sweet. But all of a sudden, it's turned bitter. But the heat of the spirit and the hand of the Lord was on me. And he says, he says it was strong upon me. And he says, I went. Probably understanding and knowing that it wasn't going to be an easy ministry he was going to have for the next 40, 50 years. But then I came to them of the captivity of Tel Abid. Now Tel is, a, is Mount. And what a te, you see Tel's all over the... the um, the area of Israel today. Matter of fact, one of the things that we do when we go to Israel, we, we get you to looking for tells. What's the difference between a mountain and a tell over there? And uh, just to identify it, one. And, and you get, begin to, after a week or so, you begin to really notice them, how they're just sticking up. And what they are, they're just buried cities. Like Megiddo. Megiddo is where we see where Solomon was. He's up on top of this, this tell, this mountain. But underneath him is about 25 different cities. And buried underneath him all the way down. And when you get down to the bottom, the archaeologists have dug out the, a city of the Canaanites that were existing during the days of, of uh, Abraham. And so you've got hundreds of years underneath these cities, and what they did was they just cover them up and then build on top of them. Well, here he is. He's come to this tell, Abib. And Abib, basically, it means the Mount of Corn. <laughs> so they're a place of where they grow corn, or they're a place where they know that they have corn, that dwelt by the river of Kibar. A lot of villages uh, up and down this valley of, or, or this river of Kibar. And they have found some of the cities. This city itself hasn't been found yet. Uh, archaeologists, uh, uh, if they keep on going and they have uh, ability to do so, they probably one of these days will find it if the Lord tarries. But here they come to this place called Tel Abib at the river of Kibar, and it's a Jewish community. It's where the Babylonians, when they brought the captivities, pretty much set these people in this area to, to live. And as it says, and I, I sat where, now notice this, he says, and I sat where they sat. And I remained there overwhelmed or astonished. And he says, among them seven days. He said, I just came where they were at, and I sat down where they sat. And he didn't say a word. Now here's another part of ministry or what ministry is all about and that is that as he will go on he will do this to gain understanding of the people and to gain compassion for the people one of the things about a minister is that he's got to have compassion for the people that he's ministering to he's got to have a love for him. 
a compassion for them. And not only that, he's, he must have an understanding of where they're at. What's going on? The pastor that goes to his office, shuts the door, and doesn't want to see anybody from Sunday to Sunday. He's, he's failing. But the pastor that's got his door open and he's ready to be with people. And I remember in the early days of, of my ministry, I would go out and work with the, the guys that were in the church. I'd go out and work on a, on, on a construction site. I'd go out and work with gardeners. In some places I wouldn't be able to go in, but I mean, places that I can get in, I went. Spent time with them. And, and, and I, I just felt that, that that gave me a contact with him. Well, this is the same thing Ezekiel's doing. The Spirit of the Lord brought him to this place, set him down there, and he just sat there for seven days and just listened. And he was just overwhelmed what he was seeing. And the reason why is because these people were so disheartened. If you want to see what they felt like, read Psalms 137. And you'll find that, that they, were, they, they were being uh, abused and taunted as, 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 as cap, uh, cap, people that were in captivity. And they were told, hey, take your, you know, come on, play those, those Hebrew folklore songs. Come on, go ahead, play them, you know. I said, No. Because they had hung their harps on the willow trees. And they said, we, we can't. When we're out of Zion, we can't. We, we can't sing. And, and they just felt like they were so unable to, to, sh to, to rejoice or to be glad or over. The, they were taken out. And he just watched them. And it came to pass at the end of the seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel, and give them the warnings from, from me. A watchman, and I want you to give them the warnings from me. One of the things that a pastor does is not just teach the word of God and is an example of the word of God, but he is also a warner. Of the word of God. He warns the flock of God. And there's times where God speaks heavily to us. And tells us don't do this. We must not go there. And he tells us certain things. And, and that watchman or that pastor must be willing and yielded. To tell the bad as well as the good. To tell the hard as well as the easy. There is today within the church body men that sit and stand in the pulpits week after week that are more interested in sharing the word of philosophy or psychology, relationship living type sermons. Telling you the keys of successful living, 12 steps or 7 steps to get your own way. And they go and they do this and they, and they just basically share their own ideas, their own thoughts. And they borrow from, from people that aren't even in, interested in the word of God. I don't understand why, it, why people don't want to hear God's word. I really, I don't understand it. I, I, I do. I know why they don't. Because they don't want to hear it. They don't want to do it. They don't want to heed it. There are people that come in and they'll come in for counseling and they only want to hear what they want to hear. If you aren't going to give them what they want to hear, they're on to the next counselor. And, and um, I've had people call up and interview me 
and ask me what kind of counseling I give and, and, and what do you think about this? And I would tell them very shortly, very quickly, oh, okay, thank you very much. And they're shopping for a counselor. And the word of God sometimes comes at us very comfortable, uh, uh, comforting, excuse me, comfortable, comf comforting, but sometimes hard. How many of you have ever been hit right between the, the eyes with the word of God? And you go, I don't want to hear that today, God. I mean, you've been, you, you've been, you've been naughty. And, and, and so, you, so you say, you know, I, I, I really, I need to get back in the word of God. I've been really sinning and, 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 and all that. And you know where the, where the real judgment parts of the scriptures are in, 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 in your Bible. So you kind of move over here to <laughs> Psalms, you know. And so I just need something comforting, you know. And you go over here and you start reading. And all of a sudden God starts talking about, you know, spanking or something like that. Chastising the children of Israel for being disobedient and all that. Oh, David, don't talk about that. I want... The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want, and he, you know, and, and all that. But, but there's times where the word of God comes to us like a hammer and hits us right here. And there's times where God told Ezekiel, you're going to be warning him. And notice what he says. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die. In verse 18, and, and thou giveth not that warning, nor speak to, to save their life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquities, but his blood will I require upon you, Ezekiel. If I tell you to go to somebody that's in sin and they're not repentive and they're not, and you don't tell them to repent and you don't tell them how to get right with God, I'm going to require this upon your hand. Now, what's God, his whole aim in this whole passage here, he says, he, says, uh, he says, I don't want them to get comfortable in their sin. I don't want them to be comforted while they're in sin. And this is the whole thing that he's driving home to Ezekiel. They're in sin. They're still not listening to me. They're still rebelling against me. And I don't want you to go there with a sweet word to them when they need correction. And so he says, I want you to deal with them. And if you don't, I'll have to deal with you. And yet, he says in verse 9, if you warn the wicked and he turns not from his wickedness nor from the wickedness, he shall die in his iniquities, but you have been deliver you've delivered your own soul. Again, when the righteous man does not uh, turn from, the righteous, from his righteousness, and commits iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, and he dies, because thou hast not given him warning. He shall, he shall die in his sins, and his righteousness, which he has done, shall be not remembered, but his blood will I require at your hand. He says, if your righteous man's walking with God, and he blows it, and I throw a stumbling block in there where he dies, I destroy him because of his sin. And you don't reward, warn him. I'm going to require it at your hands, his blood on your hands. Nevertheless, if you, if, if you warn the righteous man uh, that, that the righteous sin not, and he does not sin, he shall surely live because he is warned, also thou shalt deliver your soul. And the hand of the Lord was up there upon me, and he said unto me, Arise, go forth into the plain, and I will uh, there talk with you. Then I arose and went forth into the plain, and behold, the glory of the Lord stood there, like the glory which I saw by the river of Kibar, and I fell on my face. And then the Spirit entered into me, and he set me up upon my feet, and spoke with me, and said unto me, Go, shut thyself into your house. Now, here is where God starts to, to do some ministering things through Ezekiel that is just weird. I mean... The office of a prophet was hard, an Old Testament prophet. And God asked him to do some strange things. He said, now I want you to go home, shut the door, and stay there. Shut thyself within thy house. But thou, O son of man, behold, they shall put cords upon thee, and shall bind thee with them, and thou shalt not go out among them. I mean, don't, don't you dare go out there, and I will make 
Make your tongue cleave to the roof of your mouth that you shall be dumb, that you won't be able to speak. How's that? God says, now, even if you go outside, you're not going to be able to say anything because you're going, you're, mm, 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 mm. you're not going to be able to talk. You're just going to be able to grunt and moan and gurgle and stuff like that. And he says, you're just not going to make any sense. And thou shalt not be to them a reprover, for they are rebellious pe people. But when I speak with thee, I will open your mouth. Now this goes on for seven years. That he goes through this whole thing. When we get to uh, chapter 24, God finally opens up his mouth. In chapter 24, verse 27, he, he opens his mouth where he no longer is dumb. And he, he's able to speak plainly and all the time, whenever he wants. But for seven years, Ezekiel, mm -hmm, and when God wants to speak to him, He's able to speak plainly. And he says, but when I speak to thee, I will open your mouth, and thou shalt say unto them, thus saith the Lord God. He that heedeth, and, and, and he's going to say this 96 times in his book. Thus saith the Lord God. He that heareth, let him hear. And he that forbeareth, let him forbear. For they are a rebellious house. And thou also, son of man, Take thee a tile, take a tile, and lay it before thee, a portrait upon it, the city of Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem has not fallen yet. Remember that. It's been, it's been besieged, it's been carried away a couple of times already, but it hasn't been burned down yet. Jeremiah is still there preaching to him. But he says, now, I want you, and they're thinking they're going to escape. Zedekiah is still going to, going to be able to rescue the day. And he says, I want you to go and take a tile and draw upon it the city of Jerusalem. And he says, lay siege against it. I want you to take it, lay it down, and I want you to lay siege on it. I want you to put a fort, build a fort against it, cast a mound against it, set a camp also against it, and set battering rams against it around about. I want you to build, you know, play army man now, you know. Get all your men and put them all, the Babylonian men, put them all around the city of Jerusalem. Just, just besiege the city. Now he can't speak now. This is all visual. There's no, there's no verbal speaking here. It's all visual. And he says, moreover, take unto them an iron pan. Now this iron pan probably could have been the pan that they would use during uh, uh, their offerings. But it was a flat pan that take out ashes out of a fire or whatever. Uh, but he says, it, it, uh, like a skillet or whatever. And he says, now take this pan and set it as a wall of iron between thee and the city. Now while you're doing this, now put this, this stick this thing right in, 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 in it. And I want you to be on one side and the city on the other. Signifying... That the city is going to be besieged and that Jeremiah, as a spokesman of God, is not going to be even involved in it. He's just saying, I'm out of it. There's a wall between us. You remember what Isaiah said? God's hand is not short and that he cannot touch you or his ears dull that he cannot hear you. He said, but your sins have separated you from your God. And because of their sin and their rebellion... There's a wall, there was an iron wall that was cast between the face of Ezekiel, spokesman of God and the city of Jerusalem. And he says, and set thy face against it and it shall be a besieged and thou shall lay siege against it. This shall be assigned to the house of Israel. And he says, lie also. Now, here's another thing he tells him to do. He says, I want you to lie also upon your left side. So lay down, Ezekiel, and lay down on your left side. Oh, get to relax. Oh, yeah? He says, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it, according to the number of the days that thou shalt shall lie upon it, and thou shalt bear thy iniquity. And I have laid upon thee the years 
of their iniquities according to the number of, their, of the days. 390 days, he says. So they've, their, their years of their iniquity has been 390 years of iniquity. Now, so shall. Now, you remember the house of Israel has been taken into captivity years before the house of Judah has. And the, he says, now take the house of Israel, their, their 390 days or 390 years. And he says, bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when you have accomplished this, laying on your left side for 390 days, that's over a year. And he says, and he says, and then lay on your right side. And I imagine that was a good day for Ezekiel. Oh, get to switch. And now he lays on his right side. And you shall bear the, the iniquities of the house of Judah 40 days. And I have appointed thee each day a, for a year. Each day represented the year of their iniquities before God. And he said, and now, now there's, when you read commentaries on Ezekiel, they give you one thought about this and one thought about that, and no one, literally no one, agrees. What this symbolizes or means exactly, just that God had told Ezekiel to lay on your left side, and it represents the years of iniquity that was in the life of, of, of the northern tribes of Israel. Lay on your right, and this is, represents their years, their punishment, or whatever, on their right side. Now, there's something that I've got to say. One commentator said... And, I, and I'm still figuring this out. And I've been doing some math down here and, and all that. But he brings up the fact that of a Leviticus, a scripture in Leviticus, he says, if, God says, if when I judge you and, and when you turn from me, if you do not repent, I will take the years of your iniquity and times them by seven, he says. Now, if you do that, 390 times seven Times in my seven, it goes out to be a little bit over 2,700 years, 2,700 years. And uh, you begin to do a little bit of math from the time that they were in captivity, the 400 years of silence, the life of Christ, and now. And what he did, and, and again, I, I'm not going to get too much involved, but you can do your own math. Um, you come to the year 1967 when the nation of Israel regains control of Jerusalem. Now, I thought that was interesting. Now, if you want to talk to me afterwards and we'll talk about that, that was just interesting for me. And, 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 and um, I still got to do the math on it and uh, get it all down. But I just thought it was interesting. I can give you the, 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 the stuff, but I, I won't do it over the tape. So, um, But here, here it is. It, it's just, it, 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 he lays out, and he's, he's laying there, and, and it goes on, and he says, he says in, in verse 8, And behold, I will lay cords upon thee, and thou shalt not turn from one side to another, till thou has ended the days of the siege. And so he's there, he's on his side, he's on his side. You can imagine what he must have looked like and, and, and what was going on. And it all represented the sins of the people. Another action sermon. He said, now, he says, take also unto thee wheat, barley, beans, lentils, millets, and, and, and melt, and, and put it all in one vessel. And he says, make bread of it. He goes on, according to the number of the days that thou shalt lay upon thy side, 390 days thou shalt eat of this bread. So Ezekiel 4.9 bread. You can buy it at Rouse. You see it. Ezekiel 4.9 bread. And, and you can go there and buy it, and it's got the, the ingredients of this on, on the bread and all that stuff. But what was God trying to say? Well, basically what God was doing, the bread 
this bread was going to be the bread of the siege that the people were going to eat. Basically, they were going to throw, away, throw everything that they got left to make bread. Wheat, barley. They weren't going to have this, the, 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 the abundance of, of, of products to make bread the way they normally made it. They were going to have to throw together things to make the bread to live and to survive. In 390 days... And so they were going to throw this, and thy food, which thou shalt eat, shall be, be by weight. He says, now you're going, to, you're going to ration your food to 20 shekels a day. That is about 12 ounces of food a day. Now you're not going to be burning up calories because you're going to be laying on your left side the whole time. But you're going to eat this 12 ounces of bread. And not only that, he says, and thou shalt drink also water by measure, a sixth part of a hen. That is about a, a little bit over a pint of water a day. From the time to time shall thou drink. And he, so, so what is he doing? He's drawing a picture of what the siege was going to be like in Jerusalem. They're not going to have very much for, to eat. They're not going to have much to drink. And that's exactly what happened to them. You remember we talked about this in, Jeru in, in the study of uh, Jeremiah, how in, in Jose uh, Josephus' writings, he talks about how, how it was horrible, the siege. The people, there was more people that died of starvation than there was of, of the people that were, uh, that were carried away into ba uh, Babylon. There were just dead carcasses everywhere. And so he, he, says, he says, now, verse 12, he says, And thou shalt eat it as barley cakes, and thou shalt bake it in thy sight with dung that comes out of a man. E. No thank you, God. <laughs> and that's basically what Ezekiel says. Ah, uh, let's talk about this. He does. He does that in verse 14. He says, Lord, uh, wait a minute. We're not going to do this. What's he doing here? He says, I want you to cook it with the dung of men. That's what they were going to have to do in, in, in Jerusalem. They used the dung because they run out of the wood. And they would have to use the dung of men as fuel to burn for fire. They would normally use, and they still do in places, use the dung of animals. And in the Jewish Customs using that as starting uh, as fuel to start a fire was was acceptable. It was kosher, but the dung of a man was was unkosher, and uh, it would be defiling. And so the Lord says in verse thirteen, and thou and and the Lord uh, Lord said, even thus shall the children of Israel eat their their defiled bread among the nations where I will drive them. And then said I, Ah, Lord God, Lord God. Behold, my soul has not been polluted. <laughs> he says, let's talk about this. Well, I, you know, he objects to, to, to eating this uh, this way. And he says, God, I, I haven't been polluted. I have never defiled myself for, from my youth. I've been a good, kosher Jewish boy. I've never eaten anything wrong out of your law. And he says, he says, from my youth, even until now, have I not eaten of that which uh, dieth of itself, or is torn in pieces, neither came there abominable flesh in my mouth. I, I have never touched anything that, that was, was not of God. You know what this tells me? Ezekiel was just like Daniel in this sense. Remember when the word of God came, uh, it tells us in Ezekiel chapter 1 that, that Daniel had the opportunity to defile himself by the king's meat. They were going to give him everything to eat, everything to drink. And he says, no way, I'm not going to defile myself with this stuff. And he purposed in his heart to keep himself holy before God. And Ezekiel's doing the same thing. But this way, he's talking to God. God's telling him to do this. And he says, no, no, let's, let's talk about this. Remember Peter on the housetop of, there in Joppa? He's sitting up there in the house of, Tanner, of Simon the Tanner. And he's up there. And all of a sudden, he has this vision of the sheet that comes down and on it has clean and unclean animals. And God says, rise up, Peter, and eat. Not so, Lord. Peter, rise up and eat. Nope. 
Third time he comes to him and says, Peter, eat. Mm -mm. Nope. And then God says, don't ever call anything unholy that I've touched. And, uh, and the message, and you know the message of Cornelius and the whole opening of the doors to the Gentiles and all that. But here Peter was arguing about, hey, I'm, a, I'm, I'm kosher. I'm keeping the law. I'm stubborn about that. And here, you know, um, Gershon, our guide, when he was here several months back, you remember, he, um, I took him out to lunch, and he told me, he said, when I, 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 Roger, when I get with you, I want to have a steak and lobster. I go, what? Lobster's unclean. It's not kosher. And I thought, well, maybe he really wants that, you know. So I take him to... I take him down to um, where do we, uh, Claim Jumper. And I said, order up. And he ordered the most kosher meal I've ever seen anybody order. I, I, I mean, he would, not, he would not mix his butter with the, on the bread because you couldn't have your meat then. And uh, he did get a filet mignon, but he, it's just, but I mean, it was, it was cooked. It wasn't bloody. It wasn't nothing. I mean, it was, and he, but he was not going to defile himself. And, and here, Ezekiel's doing the same exact thing here as, he, as he's saying to God. And so, so he, comes, he comes to God, and he says this. Uh, he said, Lord, I haven't defiled myself. And then the Lord said unto me, Lo, I have given thee the cow dung then. He comes, and he comes, okay. Um, I want to get a message across to these people, but I, I'm not going to defile you in the process. So, so God says, says, use the cow dung. Uh, for man's dung and, and, and instead of man's dung, and thou shalt prepare thy bread on it. Moreover, I, I still don't know if I had <laughs> eaten bread. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, behold, I will break the staff of bread in Jerusalem, and they shall eat bread by weight. Thou hast the ration it, and with care, and they shall uh, drink water by measure. And, and he says, and they, they may lack bread and water. And be dismayed one with another, and my and, and pine away in their iniquity. I mean, because they're so rebellious, they'll die in this. In, they won't even repent. They won't even cry out to God and say, "God, please forgive us." They've gotten so hard in their life that they got to the point where they'd rather die in their sins than repent, and God have mercy on them. And that's all God was looking for: a repentant heart. And, and so we continue on in the study of Ezekiel, and let's pray. Father, we, we ask that we would never get to that place in our lives that we're so stubborn and so stiff-necked, even to the point of starvation, Lord, that we wouldn't repent. Father, we pray that we'd never get to that, that far away from you, that you would have to go to these means to deal with us. But yet, you take no pleasure in disciplining your children, but you will. And you've called a man, Ezekiel, to be a watchman. He's got a vision of, of you. He has your word in his, in his mouth. He's been commissioned and called by you. And he's been filled by your spirit. He's ready. And so, Lord, as we follow him in his ministry, may we follow you in the ministry that you have for us. We thank you and praise you for the work that you're going to complete in us. In Jesus' name, amen.